Hi there, and welcome to Season 3 of the If You Ask Betty podcast, the podcast about all kinds of development topics for all kinds of learning professionals. I'm Betty Danowitz, and this is the I Have Questions About Accessibility series episode, Accessibility in l and like to hear you say that three times fast. There's a lot of S's in that. Um, and today, today I have with me four folks who are super passionate about accessibility in L&D. I have Todd Cummings, Diane Elkins, Judy Katz, and Sarah Mercier. Did I say your name right? Sarah Mercier? Uh, that is Mercier? one way of saying it. It's Mercier. Oh. Oh, I want to say it like that. Okay. For a Frenchie, you can say Mercier, but I'm not going to ask Oh, you Sarah that. Mercier. <laughs> Sarah Mercier. What is with all that's the S's and really, C's? That's excellent. Sarah Messi. Okay, great. We're leaving all of that in. All right. Well, welcome, friends. Uh, thanks for being on the podcast. Would you please tell us real quick what you do and why you wanted to be a part of this? Uh, I have questions about accessibility series. Go ahead, Todd. You can go first. You bet. So I'm the COO at ELB Learning and have the opportunity to run with all of our custom services on that side of the business. I want to be part of this more because I love listening to Diana. I, I know that uh, Sarah is an expert on this and glad to meet Judy. So I like being part of this because I love learning more about it and what I can do in my role uh, to help move this, this forward. And I just have so many uh, experiences in terms of working with accessibility, both inside of our learning industry and outside. So it's something I continually try to, to do more and more of and, 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 and help out where I can. Great. How about you, Judy? Well, I think accessibility has been a passion for um, most of my career, but probably one of the, the earliest experiences I can remember having with it was working for Diane um, and seeing how her company does accessibility, which was so different and so great. Um, and I really fell in love with that idea. Um, but I have always you know, wanted to build things that were inclusive. I think anybody who has mm. had the experience of being on the outside or not being able to use something or not being able to access something uh, because of something inherent to them can kind of relate to that. And so it's been something that I have, uh, you know, wanted to promote and wanted to uh, participate in through throughout my career. Um, and so my instructional design career spans about 25 years now. And um, most recently, I've also added that I'm the, the product manager for Pebble Pro, um, which has a lot of accessibility focus. Um, and then I've been doing a lot of work in uh, both accessibility and inclusion for neurodivergence. Um, so that's something that that where I've really found kind of my my niche where I can speak from experience. Um, so I was super excited to be invited. Thank you. Wonderful. And Judy, you're not old enough to have 25 years of instructional <laughs> design experience. Autistics all, all often look younger. It's yeah, just one it of the benefits. Just, <laughs> there's just no way. <laughs> all right, Diane, how about you? I'm Diane Elkins with Artisan eLearning and eLearning Uncovered. And I wanted to be a part of this because Accessibility can be like uh, somebody spinning a jump rope really fast. It, it, it can be hard to get in. It can be hard to dip your toe in. And mm -hmm. so I've lived that life and of trying to get in, clawing, scratching, scrounging for any scrap of information I could get. And so I want to help make it easier for other people to get there. I was in e-learning for a full nine years before I ever heard the term Section 508. Or screen reader. Mm -hmm. Now, part of that is ableism. I didn't have to, sure. but it often is below the surface in our industry. You can go to a whole conference and not go to a single session on it. You can, in some cases, get a master's degree and not have anybody talk about it. So I want to bring it above the surface. If you've heard the term LMS, I want you to have heard the term WCAG. If you've heard gamification, I want you to hear accessibility. It, I just, I want it to be on everybody's tongues and on everybody's minds. Very cool. And Miss Mercier. So I am Sarah Mercier and I get the opportunity every day to work with some really fantastic folks at Learning Ninjas. So uh, we are definitely heavily in the space of accessibility. And I think that what makes me excited to be part of this podcast and, and why I love to talk about accessibility really, I think it probably goes back to many, many years ago, I was working at CarMax and uh, at CarMax, we, it was, I was training in a call center and we had folks that were um, completely blind. 
that we trained in the classroom that were all using uh, screen readers. So they were all on JAWS. And that was really my first opportunity to really work with folks that had true accessibility, like heavy accessibility needs. And when I started to develop e-learning, I was actually really shocked at how exclusive it was um, and how I was given direction. Well, you create this e-learning for everybody else, but you're going to need to create a separate version for all of the folks that are on screen readers. And, uh, and I always found that, that that just felt it didn't sit right with me. And similar to Diane, uh, you know, I think that when I really got into developing e-learning, I found that that accessibility features benefited everyone. It wasn't just like, oh, we're going to make our stuff and then stuff for someone else. And I think that the more that I learned about creating training that was accessible, it made mm -hmm. it better for everybody. And so I just changed the way that I designed and the way that I that I practiced e-learning design and development up front. And it didn't really put me out any. So one of the things that I like, it's similar to what Diane was saying, I love talking to people about what I've learned so far. It made me a little bit uh, uncomfortable when Todd said I'm an expert because I feel like every time I learn something, I uncover a can of worms that I know nothing about. Yes. And it's just like, it's always a work in progress. So I get excited attending things like this and being able to share what I've learned so far because it just feels like such a beast to get started. But there are so many things that you can do to really put yourself light years ahead of what you're doing now. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for that. And thanks for those quick introductions. Um, and as we mentioned, today we're talking about what accessibility means for L&D and why it's important for us. So I'm just going to start out right, right off the bat asking the big question, how do we make our learning solutions accessible? What's, what's the first thing we need to do or think or say? How do we do that? Well, there's so many things to do. I think um, I like to go, I like to cheat that question and pick two things. Okay. A big and a now. Like you need to find a champion. You need to find your why. You've got to have a strategic plan. That could, that's going to take time. But mm -hmm. tomorrow you can make sure you never, ever, ever, ever again make a slide that puts yellow on white. Like that's something you can do right now. You don't even need permission, you know? So I think it's good to, to operate on two tracks. There's no reason I can't make a change in what I do tomorrow right. while I'm working on some of the big stuff, while I'm educating myself, while I'm building support, while I'm putting processes in place. So I like to pick two. I like it. I'll throw one in that I, I kind of had in mind for the next question, but it's, it, it is more of an overall and maybe it'll segue um, uh, into some other things that you have planned to talk about, um, Betty. I think that one of the, the big um, things that we need to focus on toward accessibility is machine readability. Um, and in general, making things readable by machine so that they can be converted into many uh, different formats. So just for example, you know, we like to do things like, you know, if, if you're on social media, you read a lot of, you see a lot of um, images or there are a lot of images with text in them. Mm -hmm. um, and that's an example of something that it, um, up until now has not been very machine readable. Um, we love, as, as instructional designers, we do a lot of graphic design and we do a lot of things that are inherently not machine readable in order to make things pretty. But the technology is advancing to where we can make things that are text, that are machine readable, that are also pretty. That's one of the reasons I fell in love with the HTML5 revolution like 10, 12 years ago, is that you had the ability to make things that were machine readable, but that also had all of the, you know, the high production capacity um, that mm -hmm. could be, you know, amazingly uh, graphical and, 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 or, you know, um, and, and, 
uh, pleasing to the eye. Um, and so I think that we need to um, start examining like our methods from a development perspective um, and lean more in that direction, um, knowing that once you get something that a computer can read, you can. it is very easy to make multiple different formats, um, whether it needs to be read by assistive devices or whether it needs to be, or, or software or on, you know, different um, read aloud or uh, multiple different ways of being interpreted. Like that is a huge step um, and a huge mind shift, I think, toward the way we develop things. Mm -hmm. what, would, what would you say is the impact of us not making it machine readable? Well, so for instance, if you think about that meme that I was, you know, trying to invoke with it, you know, you have, you have text, you have all of these, uh, I, I scroll Facebook all the time and I see pictures of tweets. Um, there are mm -hmm. screenshots of tweets, right? Instructional designers have been taking screenshots forever, but now everybody can take screenshots on mobile devices. Right. So we see a lot of screenshots of tweets. Um, and so the impact of that um, for most people is you have an image that has um, that has text in it. Um, and when, you know, if you are blind or, you know, sight impaired, um, then you might be using assistive software um, and it, it'll just say there's an image there and you literally are left out of the joke. Um, mm. And so you just don't know what's there at all. Um, but why I said that it's not, you know, pr it, it was sort of previously this has been not accessible is that now OCR has gotten so good and is incorporated into so many things um, that more and more machines are able to do uh, this for us, but it still requires a little human intervention. So, for example, if I have a meme, if I take a picture of a tweet on my iPhone, um, I actually now with a recent update, um, I can, you know, my phone can actually go through and select this text and let me copy and paste it out. So, and that's my automatic alt text. I mean, mm. we're just, we're just tiny steps away from machines being able to do that all for us. Um, but it's still a matter of being informed about it. Um, and, you know, taking a few human steps to do it. So that not only are people not left out of the joke, they're not left out of the learning experience. See, I right. brought it around. I like that. <laughs> and, and it makes me think about how, you know, there's a in because I don't know about you guys, but I create a lot of slide decks, whether I want to or not. They mm -hmm. it is just part of the job. And mm -hmm. I it makes me think about how, you know, there's this trend, if you will, of a full full slide picture, but with some text on it. And that's very pleasing. And we'd like to do that. But it, is it accessible? Doesn't sound like, I mean, depends, right? If, if, if they have the technology that you're talking about, maybe. But if they don't, that person who's sight impaired is, is, like you said, left out of the joke or left out of the learning. So, And Betty, the difference is whether you lay that text on as a text box or you embed it in embed the Embed it image. in the picture, right. Because okay. if you lay it on as a text box, technology can pick that up. Can find it. Okay. But if That's you good embed it in Photoshop then there's nothing for the screen reader to read. It's just random pixels. And it's funny how like, it just sort of depends on what your need is as to whether or not you do that, right? So it's like, not like we always do it one way, but we should potentially always do it one way. Mm -hmm. Interesting. We do tend to favor being able to control the layout because yeah. I think e-learning instructional designers tend to think in slides, um, mm -hmm. largely due to, you know, the tools and how e-learning has evolved. We tend to think in slides. So we like to control that layout and control that graphic design. However, sometimes that is by, by, by uh, trying to have that control and actually putting the text into the image, like Diane was saying, um, that actually takes away a, a, a large, it takes away the machine readability and takes away a large element of accessibility. Yeah. Because the, the control needs to be in the hands of the person who has the need for adaptive mm -hmm. strategies. Mm -hmm. So my adaptive strategy might be software. My adaptive strategy might have be a person sitting next to me. We don't know what my adaptive strategy may be. But for example, um, let's say that I have dyslexia. If you have um, a presentation, a PDF, a website, and you just use native text, like you just typed in some text, just like all the text you've ever dealt with in your world, I can have a, a browser plugin called Helper Bird that mm. lets me replace your font with my font. Oh. And there's a font specifically designed for folks with dyslexia that many find it easier to read. Give me control. 
Gotcha. So yeah, it's great to say, I want to make this work perfectly visually, but as instructional designers, our graphic design needs to be secondary to people learning something. Mm -hmm. And we need to make sure that there's not a big if. You can learn this if you can read my font my way. I have, um, I actually have a top six list that covers two of the things that Judy and Diane just covered. Um, to, to go to your question is about like, what are the things you can do right now? And just yeah. kind of give like a little summary. Number one, make sure that you have alt tags for everything that you, any visual that you have. And if you can't come up with good alt text or descriptive text, then your image probably shouldn't be there in the first place. If you're marking it decorative, then it probably doesn't add value to the learning anyway. So that's even a nice instructional design check. So alt text is one. Second is color blindness test. Make sure that it passes a color blindness test. The rule of thumb is Christmas colors. So red and green, you're not going to be able to see contrast the difference if you have color blindness. Number three, a grayscale test, making sure you have sufficient contrast. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have enough contrast and for folks like me who have glasses and stuff, this isn't this isn't an us and them you know, or like a small percentage of, uh, we don't have any people that need this in our organization or in, none of our learners need this. Yeah, they do. They're, mm -hmm. Somebody doesn't pass one of these six steps. So grayscale contrast test. Number four, uh, Diane mentioned, get a screen reader. There are plugins for free on Google Chrome now. You used to have to spend thousands of dollars on JAWS readers. You don't have to do that anymore. You can just get a plugin in your browser and use a screen reader. I think that you will be shocked the first time you try one about how those things work and how mm. when you tap through the content, how much is thrown at you. Um, and then the order in which you've placed the information on in your e-learning, I mean, it uncovers so many design elements. So download a screen reader and listen to what people are hearing when they take your course. Number five is make sure that any video you have has closed captions. Mm -hmm. If you don't have closed captions, you are not done. Yep. Period. I thought you were going to say, if you don't have closed captions, you're lazy. <laughs> yeah, well, it's not even lazy, honestly, because you can use tools like Descript, which sure. is one of my favorite tools now. And you just throw your video in there and it spits out the transcript. And all you have to do is make your edits and get your SRT file. You yep. have your closed captions. You're done. You can even bake them in. So there's so many different ways to do it that are so easy. Mm -hmm. um, and then number six we have is... Stop using all caps in your titles. Use camel case. So you can use your first, your first letter of each word can be capitalized, but capitalizing every letter makes the screen reader read it like an acronym. Mm. So it's saying every single letter in your title. Wow. So those are just, mm. like, those are, and that's like a scratch the surface thing. But if you do those six things, it is like huge. Huge. And, and my only request is take these <laughs> and implement these steps in your storyboard, not when you're done building it. Because if you don't plan for it in your storyboard and your design documents up front, then it's going That's to right. take you extra work later. Mm -hmm. yep. I want to say, by the way, the thing about closed captioning and the technology coming far, like I agree, this is something like the moment has arrived. I use Otter AI. There are lots of um, lots great of tools yep. where you can just upload audio or video and it spits out a fantastic, um, you know, the technology has arrived to be able to do great OCR and great um, transcription where you just have to do edits. And again, that's getting something from either an audio or a visual form into a machine readable form um, so that then, you know, you can do closed captions, you can do a transcript, you can do lots of other things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Beautiful list. Yeah. I was, I was talking to, to Todd this morning about that it really is an important balance if you've got to get in the weeds. Like you can't do this without getting deep in the weeds. Mm -hmm. But someone in your organization needs to also be looking at the strategic level. And I know that's a lot of what Todd does. Yeah, so Todd, what what would you say when it comes to making our learning solutions accessible? What's What are like the first things that we need to do or think or say? Like how do we get into that mindset? You know, I, I think what what these three have presented to us are some fantastic stuff. I, mm -hmm. And all, all I might say from my perspective is something. The, the fact that people 
are listening to this podcast is something. Yes. Sometimes we get overwhelmed, even, you know, whether, it, you know, these 25 things or this checklist and, and the six, and these are amazing and, and I've got them down. But sometimes we just get overwhelmed by the enormity of it. And, and Diane alluded to this a little bit. My take is do something. Read, and you were kind of saying this, Betty, read something, say something, listen to someone. Mm-hmm. Do that one thing, because that's your first step. Um, to getting to where you go. You can't go from being here to in the weeds in one day. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, these these three we've got here, have years of experience, and, and we're going to learn from that. But you got to start somewhere. And sometimes that starting is just listening to a podcast or reading a book or an article, because everything we do is going to aggregate and, and help move us forward. And so and, and maybe they're in different areas, right? Maybe it's not instructional designer. Maybe we've got someone that's a manager on here and thinking, how do I influence my instructional designers? Well, you know what? Listen to this podcast. Yeah. This is going to give you some great information. So whatever it is you're doing, just do something and yeah. start there. That's great advice. Great advice. And honestly, that is what I did by trying to pull you guys together. I was talking with Diane and we, this has been brewing, I don't know what, six months now. I don't know. Mm-hmm. We've been to a lot of conferences together this year and they all blurred together. So I'm not really it's sure. February, which one. Magazine. Oh, good. I'm glad you remembered. Cause I didn't remember. Yeah. And I was like, I was like, you know, Diane, I really want to talk about accessibility, especially in immersive learning, AR, MR, VR. I get this question all the time. And my answer sucks. The answer I have is terrible. And I'm like, we, I need a better answer. I said, and then we were talking, she was like, yeah, we can have a conversation about that. And I think I came back to you like the next day. I was like, wait a minute, this is bigger. Because the more I thought about it, I'm like, this is way bigger because just the fact that I asked a question is more than most people will do until they're told to do it. Right on. And so like we, and not to give myself praise, but it's just why, why, why not have a resource for folks? So that's, you know, why I brought you guys in here to get together. And I'm gonna tell you what, right now we're like, what, 20 minutes into it. And I'm like, we've already checked every box that I could ever ask for, but we're, <laughs> we're not done talking, but you know what I'm saying? Like, I think that you guys have already shared some really amazing things. And I love the idea of just do something. That's, that's fantastic advice. And so I want to get a little bit more specific, right? So you guys gave some really great sort of overarching. Um, and Sarah, if you, is that published? Is your six ways published? Um, yes, actually. So, um, and I can't take credit for that list. That list actually originally came from Brian Dusablon. And so okay. there's a primer on the Learning Ninjas website. If you just go to learningninjas.com, there are two things. One is a free primer that you can download that has that list. Plus Excellent. it actually has a list of 10 things with links to all the different sites that you can use to check contrast and color blindness and all that Fantastic. stuff that's all out there. Um, there's also a text course um, that we um, built in Aurist. Um, that's just an SMS text course that sends you a text every day, something that you can do and learn about accessibility inclusion. They're both free and we don't track like information or anything. So just go uh, you know, access those resources. Great. And I'll make sure I put the link to that in the show notes as well. So if you're listening, that link is in the show notes. But here's the, here's why I want to get specific. And that is, how do we do this specifically with instructor-led training? So in-person or virtual, written materials. Of course, I want to talk about immersive tech, podcasting, websites. I mean, just listing off the different modalities. And that wasn't even all of them. Like, how do we, it's, it's overwhelming to me. So I guess, I don't know, just pick one and tell me what, what are your thoughts on how do we make sure that ILT is accessible or AR or what have you? I can uh, start there, Betty. I think um, this, and this governs all of these formats, so you've got to know your tools and you've mm-hmm. got to pick the right tool. So for okay. example, PowerPoint lets you add alt text. And if you're not familiar with that term, that's a description of the visual so that someone who can't see and is using a screen reader, the screen reader knows what to say about that picture. And you can pick whatever is relevant about that picture. You can do that in PowerPoint. A lot of people don't know that. You can put on auto captions, which have their um, their downfall. But PowerPoint, just plain old regular PowerPoint has a checkbox and you can get automated captions while mm-hmm. you're in the presentation. You got to mm-hmm. know your tools and you have to pick the right tools. So for example, with AR, VR, uh, mixed reality, I'm, that's not my area of expertise, but I do know that with all of these, we do rely heavily on our technology providers. 
unless I'm doing full on code and who has time for that? Right. I'm reliant on what PowerPoint integrates with or, or mm-hmm. incorporates. I'm reliant on what's in Storyline or Captivate. And with immersive technology, I'm reliant on those tools. I, and some of them are making really great strides. I just read an article the other day about, um, I don't remember if it was a Microsoft game controller or not, that maps somebody's face. And just by changing their facial expression, they can control a mm. game mm-hmm. by moving their face. Now, I can't make that happen. I can't make that technology as an instructional designer. Sure. But if I am, for my organization, about to pick a platform, let's say we want to start doing our meetings in the metaverse. Well, when I'm doing my vendor selection, I've got to make sure that even if I can't find a tool that currently has what I want, that they have a strong commitment to getting there, that they have an active roadmap and it's not just lip service and they go, sure. oh, you know, I can do that, what, 805 stuff? No. <laughs> like, so it starts with your purchasing power mm-hmm. and finding the right platform. Now, granted, if you don't know what needs to be done, it's hard to know what to ask for. So it's all a big loop in the end. Yeah. But check your tech. Check your tech. Okay. Great. I want to I, I want to jump in and add to what Diane said because Diana and I have commiserated over this for many many years and actually have talked to Todd about it even, um, which is why you know folks like Todd that represent and and Judy frankly that represent these different tool vendors is you got to be vocal with your tool vendors if your tool's not doing the job and it's not doing what it's supposed to be doing then you got to either reach out to them or switch to a tool that does. Mm -hmm. Because I cannot tell you, I have folks that I work firsthand with at Adobe, at Articulate, at Lectora, and every time that something comes up, I reach out to them and I say, this isn't doing this. And if I had a dollar for every time that someone told me, well, not enough people ask for it. Nobody wants this thing. Nobody needs this thing. So I know that it feels like you aren't being heard, but get on the community forums and get vocal about those Mm. things um, that you need in your tools and then vote with your money and go to the places where people are providing tools that have those accessibility features. I mean, Judy just mentioned that Pebble is, has a focus for accessibility, work with vendors that care about people actually being able to learn from your content and that listen to you. Um, And so, and I know the folks um, in Todd's group, you know, have put out things um, to help with accessibility. Lectora has always been kind of one of those front runners for thinking about accessibility features. So work with tools that support the work that you need to do. I I think that's so key, Sarah, as well. And yeah, we've had those conversations and we have them internally. And, you know, even with the influence I have in the organization, Oftentimes it still comes back to, well, what's the number of people that want this? Because here's here's what's going to drive that response. And it's exactly what Sarah said, which is get on there and talk to people about it. You, you know, form the groups and associations and be and reach out directly to the people inside the organizations. Um, I mean, most of them are listening. It doesn't matter what company. All of all of these companies, I think, want to try to be as responsive as we can to to our consum- consumers. And there's there's great power in this, this movement now towards mm-hmm. trying to be more inclusive and more accessibility. And so now is the time, I think, to really continue pushing that and, and moving forward with it. And so, you know, whether, wh- in, regardless of the tool, reach out to your people that are associated with the tool, reach out to the communities and let them know, hey, this is important to us. And altruism will get us so far, but then also that power of the dollar will, will, help, will help move the rest of that needle. And that's, that's very important. Um, I, I was just going to say on that topic of the power of the dollar, this is this is so much a chicken and the egg thing. Meryl mm-hmm. Evans actually has a fantastic video about Peloton and about how um, their products, their videos, I don't know how much of a workout or I don't know, but like there are videos <laughs> or something. And then there are the instructions that come with the bike or whatever. And they're so much more accessible than everybody that they might be competing against Mm -hmm. that they automatically are going to get that market that values or that utilizes that accessibility. So if you're in a situation 
situation like Sarah was saying, where your organization is their strategy is, OK, we're going to make e-learning for most people, but everybody else is just going to have to you know, read a PDF or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, then you don't think that your learners need it because you've already excluded them. Right. And therefore, your learners aren't telling you there is anything wrong. You're not telling the tool vendors there is anything wrong. The tool vendors are saying, well, nobody's asking for it because sure. the tool vendors didn't build in accessibility in the first place. So it's this whole big chicken and the egg thing. And it takes people who care to kind of yes. break that cycle yes. and who value inclusivity and who value if it's a dollar kind of thing, um, including all of your potential learners or including all of your market, however yeah. you look at it. I, yeah. I, I do want to add one other side to that, too. That is such a fantastic example, Judy. And there's another thing on the flip side of this is that tools can't do your design for you. Right. Mm -hmm. so you also have to know how to do your job. You have right. to know what it means to design for accessibility. So you have to go out and learn how to do this job. And this job includes designing for accessibility. Yeah. So it includes learning how to do these things. And that means that, you know, I can pick up a tool that has, you know, the ability to build in color contrast and the ability okay. to add alt text. But if you don't put it in there, it won't work. Yep. So it, you can't, you also can't just say, well, I want these tools to do it for me. You do Absolutely. have to learn how to do this work and make sure that you're, you know, you're, you're performing those functions as well. So I just want to, I just want to point out that Sarah just called all y'all out, <laughs> uh, specifically those who, um, I know, you know who you are, you buy a planner every year and it sits there and you don't write in it and you don't <laughs> use it, a paper planner. I, I don't Sarah just this. looked. I Sarah just looked at her desk, so I think I just well, called I, her out. She's like, "Well, uh, but uh, yeah. <laughs> there it is, right there, there it is." I mean, it's, wow. it's, it's such an interplay because tools have such an important part to play in what yes. they enable, in the amount of workload they take off your plate, and the reverse is also true that they can't do your design for you. That's they right. can't necessarily do all your alt text for you yet. You know, stuff like that. Um, and so it, there still is very much an interplay. The design is important the tools are important right and, and i think it goes to what sarah was saying earlier it's still a coveyism you start off with the end in mind mm -hmm. so before you ever even get into the tool whether it's ilt you know immersive vr or some of the other you know rapid authoring tools you've got to start thinking okay how what am i going to do and then you go and, and diane kind of said this as well then you kind of identify what tool is going to help me the most but if, mm -hmm. but if you're waiting for the tool to tell you kind of figure out where everything else, then you're already late to the game. You're already late. You're already yep. behind that eight ball. So you, you've definitely got to start right there at the beginning and say, okay, I'm building an instru instructor-led training course. What are the things that I can do to, 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 to make it inclusive and accessible for as many people as possible? That That's where you start. You have so to actually, care about it, right? Okay. You have to care yeah. about it. It yeah. can't just be something that was assigned to you, so you need to do it. You have to You have to understand it enough and internalize it enough that you're compelled to do I, it, that you have to do it. I think one of the best ways to do that is familiarization. Mm -hmm. Not Reading blogs and such is great for a good talking point or you know, talking to people like this. Um, it's great to get some talking points, but you need to find your personal why. And yeah. if that's not already in your life, well, first of all, maybe have a more diverse group of friends. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I have found that people care more when they have a personal connection to someone who is impacted yes mm -hmm. by the, by these choices agreed so yeah. i don't mean oh well, let's go well oh, you know, I, knew, I need to go find a blind friend you know i'm not it's not what i'm talking about but the more you, you, could, you could like put an ad out on facebook yes. marketplace yes no I, don't do that that was a joke yes. I was just I like, that. Okay. um but the more you can really understand the impact because yes, I just said, check your tech. Yes. We just talked about tools, but at the end of the day, this is not about regulations. It's not about technology. It's about people. Yes. This is about people and the barriers that they can face to do what they need to do mm -hmm. and to just feel like a, you know, an equal human being. Yeah. And so one of the best things I ever did was um, we hired a woman who uses a screen reader in her daily life to sit down next to me and take one of my courses. And I watched her and I watched how she interacted with the technology and I heard what was frustrating to her. And it, it was just, it's so powerful. And, and even if you don't have that level, and by the way, 
every university has an accessibility office. Go, mm-hmm. they college mm-hmm. students will work for you know pizza. Pay them though, please pay them. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and and so you can find folks, talk to them. What what are struggles? Um, but even that, just just having someone in your life that you care about who has an impact, it's going to change your perspective on the world. Um, so you got to know your tools, but the more you can find out about the people. So just knowing what are some of the conditions and what barriers can they throw up at, um, what barriers can be thrown up with, with bad design. Um, and, that's, and that's going to be more important. The people side is going to be more important the more human interaction in your course. Mm-hmm. So in e-learning, it is heavier on the tech. And instruction, instructor-led, yes, there's some tech components, but it's way more about interpersonal. You know, I can say, hey, everybody's in the back of the room. Come on forward. Come on forward. Well, what if I've got somebody who needs to step out urgently periodically with no control? They want to sit in the back. I'm not going to yeah. make them come up front. What if you've got, um, like, do you know the etiquette for working with a sign language interpreter? You know, you look at the person you're speaking to, not at the interpreter. I, yeah. I, I have um, was a physical therapy the other day and the, the patient next to me was deaf and had a sign language interpreter and the physical therapist yelled the whole time. Uh, and there's a sign language interpreter. She didn't need to yell and kept asking the interpreter, what does he think? What does, no, that's not the etiquette. Well, she didn't know. I'm not shaming right. her. She didn't know. Mm -hmm. And so we need to understand who the people are, what the impact of our choices is, and how to be better in all of these environments. And it is different in each of the environments. I don't I don't have that issue. I don't in 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 my self-paced e-learning, I don't have to address the fact that someone might not want to do a role play because they stutter. I I don't that doesn't come up for me. But if I'm using rehearsal, one of the ELB tools, yes, people have to upload a video of themselves. Um uh, delivering a sales pitch or whatever the training is or responding to an angry customer. Well, yeah. how do we handle that? That was a beautiful plug for ELB. That was very kind. <laughs> Judy, I think you had something. Go ahead. Oh, to your question. So back to the, you know, how do we do this with ILT, with written materials, yeah. and, you know, the ILT and everything like that. I think that, you know, rather than approaching this from a, um, uh, a modality perspective, I find it helpful to um, look at, you know, what I am trying to accommodate for. Um, and there will be specific things with each modality that I want to address. But even before that, um, the choice of modality might be um, affected as well mm-hmm. by who I am trying to accommodate. And by the way, I'm not trying to say, okay, there might be uh, you know, certain certain courses where you're trying to accommodate a deaf audience, certain courses where you're trying to accommodate a neurodivergent audience. I mean, that might be the case sometime for certain clients because of their audience. But I think that looking at the overall, um, and I think that now we're just, we're becoming more and more aware of more and more different needs that we want to accommodate. The, cho- the choice of the modality itself is part of, is affected by um, the kinds of things that we want to accommodate. So, for example, Betty, you mentioned AR and VR, which can be problematic in terms of sight and um, hearing and everything Mm -hmm. like that. However, for people with mobility issues, for people with agoraphobia, for people with sensory sensitivities, which includes a lot of the neurodivergent crowd, um, VR can be way, way more accessible and, you know, a a much, much better way to actually interact with people and go to conferences and um, exist in something like a physical space with people. Um, And I think that, uh, you know, the last two years over the, the Panini, you know, we, we, uh, experience a lot of different things and we experience how a lot of people like actually okay working from home is what I'm gonna do now and I actually liked doing virtual instructor led instead of having to sit in the classroom with people and you know we're we're going to um, we're going to see I don't want to say the fallout but like the 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 consequences or the the um, learnings that we're taking away from all of that um, more and more um, mm-hmm. and so I think that you know uh, 
and 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 to that point, you know, we are there's a lot of good information about there about you know how to make different modalities work for particularly I think um, for sight and hearing. Um, I have a couple of uh, articles coming out uh, addressing the same for neurodivergence um, by modality, by, you know, instructor led training, e-learning, et cetera, um, on learning solutions. And but I think that like actually the choice of uh, modality that we pick um, is also affected by that. And I think we're mm -hmm. not that organizations aren't necessarily going to like it either because it's going to trend more toward e-learning, toward virtual instructor led. And you'd think that they would like it because that also tends to save a lot of money. But at, all of us have worked in e-learning, so we know how much organizations like e-learning as opposed to, you know, what they feel is is the more premier experience of instructor-led training a lot mm -hmm. of times. Um, so actually, the the um, the benefits of the more electronic methods, um, I think, are are coming out in a lot of really interesting ways. And I'm not, I, I just don't know how it's gonna how it's gonna go over with organizations. But I hope they look at the the increased possibilities uh, yeah. that the electronic methods provide. I, so, I have to say uh, that I think that that comment that you made, Judy, about choosing modality in the first place is so incredibly important. Mm -hmm. And just I, I kind of had a light bulb moment because it's something that I think about, but I don't think I've ever thought about it in the way you just said it, is that it just reinforces how important it is to be making these decisions during design mm -hmm. before you do anything what are you trying to teach who are you trying to teach where are they what do they have available to them and then you create your whole training plan around that so right. whatever mix of modalities you use and however you structure them and however you design them you have to think about that up front you can't wait mm -hmm. till later and be like oh crap now i need to do this other version for somebody else like you have to make those decisions which goes back to what diane said about empathy and thinking about the fact that you're teaching human beings not yeah bubbleheads, right? Right. So let me ask you this then. So let's say I'm, I'm, I have a learning project. I'm trying to create a solution for it. I do my uh, design thinking. I come up with an empathy map. I create personas. I'm doing all of my, the pieces that I'm supposed to do. And I find that, uh, you know, I'm creating this for, you know, 150 people. And I ask, you know, are there, are there any folks in here who have uh, accessibility needs? And the answer, uh -huh. so they're shaking of heads and, and, <laughs> and making of faces because can't see that. So uh, apparently I'm not supposed to ask that or. No, I love it, that you asked that. <laughs> but, does it, but does it matter? Like, because do, do the stakeholders know that? I mean, they only know if somebody has said I have accessibility right. needs. If someone right. has not said that, they don't know. So and I can't think of a single reason why somebody wouldn't be able, wouldn't be willing to disclose a disability to their employer. Uh -huh. Right. I no, mean, I yeah. can think of a couple, but yeah, no, yeah, yeah. No, I know you're being facetious. So, 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 so what my question is then, what do I have to then, should I then is the, I guess the better question, should I then build and, and design so that I accommodate anyone and everyone? How do, you, how do you make that decision? And I'm not saying that mm -hmm. it's a bad idea and I'm not saying it's a good idea. I'm really asking you, how do you decide that? Well, everybody's first leaning all, forward to answer this. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go <laughs> first of all, ahead. absolutely ask. Mm -hmm. absolutely ask. Okay. Ask. Good. Make it, good to know. Ask, make it easy to respond and make sure that I just got a great tip at a conference this week from Samantha Evans, who's a great one to follow. Meryl Evans and Samantha Evans, not related Two great people to follow on LinkedIn. <laughs> And she's, she was talking about access barriers for certification exams. And she said, if your form to request an accommodation on a certification exam is a PDF that isn't accessible, you've mm. got a problem. Right. So make it easy and make it a one-stop shop if somebody needs to call that they don't get routed around at 12 places. Mm -hmm. So that's number one. Always ask. Number two, you will have people with low contrast issues, whether it's color or whatever you will. Um, the highest demographic for color blindness is um, the U.S. male Caucasian, mm -hmm. 8%. So what I don't I don't know the math on that. You have 12 people. Odds are you have somebody who's colorblind. So yeah. just assume you've got that. And then even people who don't necessarily have a disability might have problems in a loud room, you know, mm -hmm. Turn on the closed captioning in PowerPoint. It's not perfect and it's getting better, 
it's a checkbox. Mm-hmm. Check mm-hmm. And what if somebody's sitting in the back in a conference room and the, the, um, the room next to them is being, is being loud or yes. your microphone didn't work. And you go, can everybody hear me? And you see three people nod. Yes. And so right. you assume everybody can hear you, you know? So mm-hmm. there's certain things that are just, just always worth doing. Now, at the same time, I'm going to give the flip of that argument. I don't know how to make something that works for every possible combination of situations that a learner could possibly feasibly have. Like, I just, I just don't know how to balance that. And that's why there's standards like WCAG. So the web content accessibility guidelines say, here's a set of best practices that get you to where we collectively, all of these smart people who do all these focus groups and all these user comments have said, hey, here's a great standard to shoot for. And let that be your guide if you don't have a specific reason to go farther in one area or another. Mm-hmm. I, I like want to add on. <laughs> so go I ahead. love what everyone has said so far. Um, I wanted to say that there is a baseline, just kind of tagging on to what Diane said, there's a baseline of, of accessibility that everybody needs to do, period. Like you don't have to poll people and ask if if people have color blindness or they have a visual impairment, like that literally you just do it. Mm-hmm. Now, do I need to hire someone to do ASL for my next training, right? That's, That's where you kind of get into things where it's like, okay, if I have special accommodations that I can't, like that would not be part of my typical routine. Now I hear myself saying this and I know that this is not great, but it is the reality of our world today and budgets and and availability of resources and that kind of thing. So, and to Diane's point, like, is there a way to accommodate everybody in every single possible best case scenario for them? Uh, Not necessarily, right? Mm -hmm. But the thing that I, makes me cringe is when people say, should I just ask people if they have disabilities? <laughs> and the answer to that is just terrifies me, right? Instead of putting the focus on the disability, what we found success in is asking people, are there things about this training that made it difficult for you to take? Mm, yes. okay. What would you improve, right? What made it hard for you? Were you able to complete the activities? Were you able to, com- you know, uh, were you able to finish all the videos, not watch the videos? Were you able to, you know, access all of the information in this course? Did you have run into any challenges? So take the onus off of the person and in disability and put it onto you and your content and mm-hmm. whether or not you were able to effectively use that content to teach someone something. And that can help you uncover things without getting into people disclosing about mm-hmm. disability. Sure. And just for the record, I didn't say I did not say, do you have disabilities? I said, do you do you have accessibility needs? But you still made a face and grimace and you just did it again. So you don't want me to ask that. You want- I just feel like it's putting it on the person. And I, get, and I completely agree. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's just a, a little shift. Yeah, Betty, I'd like like to throw something in that I think will shed some light on that. And I, um, so um, first of all, when asking the question of, you know, do you have this? I would like to say some disabilities are known by the organization and some aren't. So for example, if somebody is blind or hard of hearing, chances are their organization knows. If somebody is neurodivergent, chances are their organization does not know. In fact, there's an incredibly great chance the person themselves doesn't know. Yeah. So what, I mean, you, you just all, there are some things that you simply are always dealing with regardless of whether the person or the learner themselves even knows. Mm-hmm. And there are lots of things about accessibility features that we might commonly implement like closed captioning that help not only other disabilities, but that help you know, just lots of situations like Diane, you were saying, what if it's a loud room? Okay, so let's talk about closed captions. Closed captions are usually implemented um, for people who are blind or uh, sight impaired. I really hope I'm saying that right. Um, uh, and um, I'm sorry, not, I'm sorry for back it up. <laughs> closed, closed captions are, are, are normally um, uh, implemented for people who are deaf or hard of hearing, hearing impaired. Um, and however, um, they also are incredibly useful um, for people with audio processing um, issues, which is very, very common uh, with autistics and ADHD. Um, 
However, over the pandemic, I also heard a lot of with my children here at home, um, it was incredibly useful for me to be able to just turn off the volume on the video and just read the closed captioning. Or if I'm, you know, in the school drop off line, you know, and it's not a something where I can really hear um, the video then or uh, start and stop or I have to start and stop a lot, uh, closed captions help me um, read and keep my place better. So what I'm saying is that even when there are things that we might choose to implement or not implement due to a known disability, those things still might be useful to unknown disabilities, and they still might be useful to simply people in life Mm -hmm. situations. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that's one of the reasons the answer, you know, to me is, you know, don't be a jerk. Um, You know, uh, all of these things are just helpful for a lot of people um, in situations and with needs that you may not even know anything about. Yeah, that's very true. Also, and Todd, I know you haven't you haven't been able to jump in. We have not let you get word in edgewise. You're next. Hold on, but I have one thing. Um, for me and my family, we do not have any diagnosed disabilities, difficult with hearing, nothing like that. I my kids tell me that I can't hear, um, and th- that might that might be true. When there is a lot of noise, I will not hear what you're saying. Um, but my point is, we all watch any show that we watch with closed captions. Mm-hmm. And it has become a habit for us because, and, and I honestly, a lot of times I'd rather read it. Like I like, cause so, sometimes the music is so loud, I can't hear what they're saying anyways, or yep. there's an air conditioner or there's a dog or there's a kid having a conversation. So or accents, mm-hmm. accents, or oh, lots yes. of stuff going Ooh. on in the show itself. Yep. Oh, yeah. Just, just um, try to understand that lead detective on broad church. I dare well, oh yeah, exactly. <laughs> so like, so it, I, I completely can understand that. And for me, closed captions are, are always helpful. I always want them on there. Um, go ahead, Todd, please. We would love to hear from you. <laughs> I really, this is fantastic. I, I love that we're part of a learning community. Mm-hmm. And I think sometimes we forget that, you know, we think of our learners, but all of us, our learners. We're all part of the learning community. So, so let's keep learning. Yeah. Every We all remember this as instructional, uh, well, as facilitators. I always go back to that. Those are my roots. I always learned from my class what I needed to do and what I didn't need to do, what mm-hmm. kind of individual I needed to pay a little bit more attention to or learn from as to how I could help them learn better. And then I implemented that in future classes or in future opportunities. Let's make sure we're doing this as designers and developers, that we're continuing to learn. We're, we're the learning community. So mm-hmm. let's continue to learn from these things that, you know, we've learned today on this podcast. There's some great things. And then I, I love what Judy said. Let's not be jerks. For me, I might phrase it a little bit different. Let's show some grace. Right. I love that word. Oh, that's nice. I like yeah. that. Grace. Yeah. <laughs> and, and learn from that. We're all learning at different levels. Sometimes we expect people to learn as quickly as we do and adapt as quickly as we do and change is different and and implement and and, and all these things. Let's show some grace and learn from each other Mm -hmm. and and continue learning. And when someone makes a mistake, let's show that grace to say, oh, you know what? A great way to maybe help in the future might might be this. And, and, you know, I love Sarah's thinking of that person, which is what Diane said. The way we think of the person is, is after that, how did you... How did you learn? What were some of the challenges that, that, that you had as part of this so that that focus isn't on their disability, but it's on kind of me? What can I do better next time to yeah. make sure that this this helps you? And so I, I think learning and grace are two two big pieces of, of what we've all been talking about. So if we put that together, it's the, the mantra is don't be a jerk, give some grace. <laughs> That's perfect. I love yeah. it. That is the I have I have five boys. Four of my five boys are colorblind. Okay. And oh, so, wow. That's way more than average. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, my family's above average. Um, yeah. Fever, you know. Yeah. Um, but, well, but this- so it's very much been an accommodation in our home to try and work with our children and, and make sure we're, we're helping them. And, and we ask for a lot of grace from my boys. Because yeah. Of- I remember when I was in high school, we were going on a, a school trip to the, I think, to the capital, to Lansing. And my favorite teacher in the whole world, who is male Caucasian, uh, was driving. 
And I was sitting in the seat behind him. He's like, Betty, come here for a second. And I was like, what? Because when you get into the to the Lansing, the lights are no longer straight up and down. They're sideways. And that was new right. for us. Uh, there, there's a lot more of them now. But like it, back back in the day when I was in high school. And anyways, you know, when dinosaurs still roam the earth. So anyways, um, dinosaurs and oh. traffic lights. he's like, he's like, Betty, come here for a second. I'm like, I'm like, what? He's like, what color is that light? Are you? I'm like, are you serious? He's driving the bus. <laughs> yep. And he's like, I'm colorblind. Is it red or is it green? Because it's sideways and I don't know. And mm-hmm. I was like, it's green. And like for the rest of the time, I sat there over his shoulder and watched the lights. He didn't ask me to do that. But mm-hmm. I was like, I w- let's not die today. Uh, <laughs> let's just make sure. And and that was the first time I ever met or knew. And I had known him for many years. I had no idea he was colorblind until that moment. Mm-hmm. And I'm glad he asked me because he probably would have gone instead of stopping or whatever it was. But but it's like you said at the very beginning, Diane, that that, you know, accessibility means nothing to you until you know somebody that needs it mm-hmm. or you need it yourself. And, uh, I think, yeah. and I think we can append our don't be a jerk. Show okay. some peace. Yeah. Let's not die today. Let's not die today. I love, I love it. it. I love it. <laughs> Oh my God. I love it. All right. So I've got, I've got one more question. If you guys can hang with me just, just a little bit longer. Um, because this is a lot. Can we all agree on that? That this is, it is a lot, not that, and that's not a, that does, that should not make us not want to do it. Uh, we just have to recognize that once we can get our arms around it, 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 it will, like you guys said, it becomes part of your design process and it won't be a lot at first, but at, in the beginning, it's like anything else new that you're taking on. But should this be someone's entire job? Like, should there just be a job role that is to review what you've created for accessibility and sort of make them accessible? It depends on the volume of training that you're putting out. So if you work in an organization where you're putting out a high volume of training, then sure. If you don't, then you're probably not going to be just from a resource and budgeting perspective. You're probably not going to be in a position where they are going to have the resources to make it a full-time job. If you're Mm -hmm. just putting out a course here and there, it's when you can bring in a contractor, hire a vendor to evaluate your courses one off. But one thing that I feel very strongly about, and I know just from having conversations with the folks in this session is that don't assume that because there is a you know a blind person or a such and such person in your organization and go reach out to them that you've got it covered um, and especially we haven't talked about this much today and this is really an area where judy's doing a lot of work um, in inclusion that mm-hmm. is like you need to get a person that works in dei that can consult you on that um, because that there are a lot of decisions that you have to make. And so for us in working with our clients, we have folks that do those reviews. I don't have a full-time person on staff that does it, but I have vendors that review every single one of our courses, specifically whether it's DEI or accessibility functionality through um, you know, early in the process. So, and they're they're reviewing after you've already made those things part of your both. design process. We, were, we have yeah. them review our storyboards because you can't you can't get to the end and have already done and then all have to and yeah, like, have to go and fix everything. Oh no, yeah. this whole scenario is totally messed up because we just used a whole lot of assumptions about the people in this scenario and their characteristics, sure. and you know you just get end up in a you end up wasting a lot of time you have to do it early on but mm-hmm. we do qa checks on things like did you make sure all the alt text is there all the closed captions timed appropriately so you check both ends gotcha gotcha i would say also that you know obviously depending on the size of the organization like sarah said volume um or you know the size of your team um it may not be that you have all of those needs but having somebody whether it's uh you know somebody that is part of their job or a you know consultant or a a number of consultants um create your strategy Mm -hmm. and create your processes for you know this is how we do things this is how we approach things from a design perspective this is how we approach do specific things from a development perspective you know uh so that they're setting up uh standard processes uh for instructional designers to use um, that are specific to the tools that you're using as well, um, I think is a fantastic uh, way to go. Because this is, I mean, we, we've talked, we've, how many times have we just said in the past hour, this is so big, how can we get our, 
our hands around this. This is this is about sight. This is about hearing. This is about mo mobility. This is about neurodivergence. This is all of these things. Um, but having um, experts who can advise on things and help you mm -hmm. set up your, your process, who, who have deep knowledge um, in those different areas, I think is so, so important. Um, we worked with some fantastic um, experts who have, you know, certifications and this is what they do when we were, when we were creating Pebble to be something that would just automatically, for, for the most part, spit out accessible content. Mm -hmm. um, so if anybody needs recommendations, hit me up on LinkedIn, because there are some people who are amazing, the amazing depth in what they do. Um, and I think that that is, is really important, even if um, you're not having somebody internal who is just doing that for every single course that you make. And of course, making a part of the QA process. Process so that you're making sure those standards are followed. I love that you mentioned that. Yeah. And yeah. I, I think it's a, it's a both and because yeah. I mm -hmm. absolutely believe you need someone on your extended team who you can go to for detailed questions, who can check your work. I don't send something out without checking for missing commas. I'm certainly not going to send something out without checking the accessibility. People mm -hmm. make mistakes. People do it wrong. So you absolutely need a, an expert on your extended team, but everyone on the team should know what they're doing in their area of influence. Mm -hmm. So the instructional designer needs to know every way that the instructional design can impact. And yeah, we talked about, you know, don't write to something you can't do. Don't write yeah. a drag and drop if you can't do a drag and drop. But it mm -hmm. also can be things like, what if I'm teaching communication skills? And one of the key teaching points is about watching for nonverbals. Well, I've just assumed my learner can see, you know, so what if the what if the very skill you're teaching assumes a certain sense mm. or ability? Like that's big. I, I totally I'm, thought I, you were going to make that about eye contact because this is something that yes. I bring up with the neurodivergence yes. thing yes. as well. Sometimes the content that we teach is is Probably. not accessible. They, yeah. Is I'm sorry, ableist. Yeah. Yeah. Ableist. I lost, yeah. The word ableist just fell out of my head, right? And <laughs> and it's very, very standard content that you would find in every course. I, was, I apologize for interrupting. Though. Get back so, to your but it's, it's a great point because there's there's so many things that, you know, if I'm teaching CPR and I say, look for signs of breathing, uh, you know, listen for breath, uh, regular breath sounds, you know, call someone, have somebody you know, or call for help, call 911, like that is just assuming a certain set of abilities. So I can't have a QA tester manage that. My instructional designer mm -hmm. needs to embrace all of that themselves. And trying to retrofit a course for accessibility is way harder and way more time consuming and way more expensive mm -hmm. than training your team to do it themselves from the beginning. Mm -hmm. It starts with a prototype too. Like if, if I haven't set up my templates for accessibility, I am wasting time down the road. Yeah. Yep. Well, it sounds like it's it should definitely be something that we focus hard to learn and understand, and maybe have maybe a good a good a good best practice is to have somebody on the team that is expert level or close to it, right? Somebody who's really focused on that. Um, that's definitely what I'm hearing. And if you have the resources, yes, somebody who is, that's their entire job. I love, I love to hear all of that. Um, so one last thing, and then we'll kind of do our wrap up, uh, in that is I want to just kind of go around just like sort of popcorn style. Like, what would you, if someone said, give me one thing to do and start today, cause I know this kind of ties back to the, what we were talking about earlier at the very beginning, what's the one thing that someone should do today in in, in making their learning solutions more accessible. Todd, you get to start. <laughs> well, for me, it, it, it would it would be find a friend, so to speak. Find, find someone. If, if you're looking to start, meaning you, you don't even know where to start, find a friend. Mm -hmm. And that friend could be an article. It could be a person. But but find somewhere to go mm -hmm. to, to, to help. To, yeah. to get you there because I mean, we've heard kind of at the front end of the podcast about all the, you know, what are the cores core things that we need to do? And for me, it'd, it'd go back to, for example, if I were today have to do it, I wouldn't know. So I'd, I'd go to a Sarah, I'd go to a Diane, I'd go to a Judy. I'd say, okay, let me ask you, what do I do today? Well, to me again, that's, that's something I did that. I made my connection with someone that's going to help me start today. Yep. How about you, Judy? 
Um, I'm going to make it really, really tactical. Stop embedding text in images. I'm just going to hammer that home a little bit. That's a great first step to giving up some of that layout control. And it's something that we end up doing even uh, when we're using more accessibility friendly courses that make more mm -hmm. like web like content. Because we're trying to keep that control, we embed text in images. Let it go. Let it go. Um, find other ways. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd tell people to work on that one first. All right, Sarah, how about you? I'm actually going to reinforce something that Judy mentioned, because I think it's really, really important is to either create a standards guide if you don't have one mm -hmm. or incorporate this stuff into your standards guide to ensure that you're checking for it in accessibility. So those six steps that I talked about earlier, put it into your design mm -hmm. guides, put mm -hmm. it in your storyboard, make sure that there's a place for it up front in your design documents. So create the structure for it and then you won't forget about it later. So just start to work it into your process. All right. And Diane? I would say change your social media algorithm. Ooh, you get good. what you go after. And so you're gonna see same, same, same. Just what LinkedIn is my social media of choice professionally. Um, and just t um, sign up to have a search or I forget how you do it LinkedIn, hashtag accessibility. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Your feed will change. Yeah. And then start liking posts, even if you don't like it, uh, commenting on posts and LinkedIn will give you more of it. It will change your feed. And yeah. then once you start seeing more of it, follow those people. And a lot of them are personal stories. So sometimes what you'll get is, oh, here's a great webinar. But um, that's how I found Meryl Evans. Mm -hmm. In fact, she just connected to me on LinkedIn the other day because she's going to be on one of our podcasts together. Yeah. And I'm like, how am I not? Like, how am I not connected with her? Because she is all over my feed. And it's because yeah. she has hashtag accessibility and I've liked some of her stuff. And um, she is a, an advocate for deaf and hard art of hearing. And she shares her personal experience. And when you really get, oh, wow, I didn't think about this impact. Yeah. And you get the why behind these choices. You're going to, A, be more passionate about doing it and B, you're going to be better at making critical thinking decisions. Mm -hmm. You're not just following a checklist. You're going, I get the impact of yeah. this. And I yeah. understand how my choices are going to impact people because now you have all of those stories. So get those stories in your feed wherever you get your information. That's a great. That's a great tip. All right. Two quick questions, I promise, as we wrap up. Uh, number one, what is your best piece of life advice? And it has nothing to do with accessibility. Just what what is what's your best piece of advice about life? Life advice, however you want to say it. I'll I'll go. I don't know. That's my best. It's the one I can think of, and that is um, don't wait for something else to happen first. Mm -hmm. Good advice. Uh, I've, I've moved a lot in my uh, life, and sometimes I didn't know if I was going to move, so I didn't really do this because I thought I might move, and then I ended up being there for three years, and I'm like, no, just. Don't wait. If you want to do something, do it. Don't don't wait for life to be perfect or stable or anything because it won't I like be. It. I like it. Todd, how about you? My go to lately has been grace. Just, you know, I encounter in so many individuals in so many different areas of their lives here in my company, you know, in my family outside. And it's just more and more. It's just been give some grace. Yeah. Give people room. To, to make some of those mistakes and then learn from them and then and then shift how you can in order to accommodate them. And, and I'm not talking even about accessibility because all of us have some degree of accessibility that we need to be accommodated on. I certainly do. And so I try to give more grace. Yeah. So that would be mine. Give grace. Like give some it. grace. I like it. Judy. This is going to be in direct conflict with everything we've just talked about with accessibility because there's so much to do. But this is the advice that I am trying desperately to take. Do less. Mm. Think about that. Think about an area of your life that it needs to be applied to and do less. Do less. Mm -hmm. All right, Sarah, it's down to you. I, like, I feel ill-equipped to, to give life advice. <laughs> Um, so I will say the thing that I've been trying to do for myself lately is just spend more time in nature. And it kind of goes with what Judy says, but like just to connect more with nature and not robots and computers. But that's yes. because of the line of work that I do. Sure. But just getting out in nature and being around people in like the real world and not our work world could be really 
I think it can be really nice to connect with being a human again. Yes. So. Agreed. And I would say mine is, you know, obviously we've learned this today. It's, it's don't be a jerk, right? <laughs> Give grace and let's not die today. So, <laughs> and if you, if, if you skip to the end, you missed that story. So you need to back up in the podcast. All right. Where can people find you if they want to after the show? Go ahead, Todd. Uh, I'm a lot like Diane. My social media of choice is LinkedIn. And so I'm, I'm, I'm there via LinkedIn. But, you know, people can always just email me. I've got the easiest email in the world, Todd at elplearning.com. Mm -hmm. So reach out. I love to hear from people and connect and, and learn where I can. Awesome. Judy. Um, I'm going to go with that meme and so just say not Facebook unless all y'all get cool with a lot of things really quickly. Um, so if you want to keep it <laughs> professional, um, LinkedIn is definitely the best. That's where I'm most active out in the, in the sphere and definitely where I want to have conversations like this. I'm super easy to find. Yeah. And Judy's Facebook is not for the faint of heart. <laughs> it's now fun. everybody is definitely going to go. Ahead no, you, you have to edit that out. Yeah. Uh, all right, Sarah, how about you? I, I actually try not to spend a whole lot of time on LinkedIn. <laughs> not terrible. Um, so learningninjas.com. That's Perfect. the easiest way you can contact me. And I, you can get Sarah at learningninjas.com is my email. So super easy to get in touch with me. Awesome. And Diane? I, I would say LinkedIn is where I'm most active. You can also check out my blog at elearninguncovered.com. That is very sporadic. It's sporadic. There are moments of spread out brilliance. Yes. <laughs> That's what my LinkedIn looks like, Diane. <laughs> it's like every no. once in a while I pop in, do a bunch of stuff and then disappear for a few minutes. I love it. Moments of spread out brilliance. Yes. Well, thank you so much, Todd Cummings, Diane Elkins, Judy Katz, and Sarah Mercier for sharing your thoughts today. And thanks to the listeners for hanging out with us. Uh, don't forget to tell your friends and watch for another episode of the If You Ask Betty podcast soon. Peace out.